stay this side of the room. <laughs> well, we have to stand closer together because oh, there's oh like, God, it's <laughs> like yeah. pairing. There's only one camera, okay. and it's not wide enough for you. <laughs> 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 let, let me. So, uh, hello, he's Nat. This is Duncan. Hello. <laughs> this is my side of the room. Cheer. Yay. Yay. More than that, come on. Yay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are both freelance programmers, currently working at Spring and Nature, building systems uh, to advance the state of science publishing. Uh, and we've been using Kotlin for about a year on line of business applications. Yeah, which reminds me, we need to renew a contract too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we started uh, when Kotlin was still in beta, building some proof of concept business intelligence and visualization applications for sort of in-house sort of analytics. Um, and then about the time that Kotlin 1.0 was about to come out, we had to take them into production. So we basically brought the code up to date with the sort of slight changes in the language between the beta and 1.0. Uh, and then sort of took that forward in production since then. Uh, so that's been sort of... Yeah, and that's kind enough. I and mean, what he's not saying is that um, he decided to find another language after watching me try and program in Java 8, basically. <laughs> yeah, so actually what inspired us to look at a lot of JVM languages and, and end up picking Kotlin was... Uh, difficulty using Java 8 streams, particularly lots of sort of functional programming. Uh, standard features are not there. There's no sort of, well, zip, uh, sort of transpose. And then the difficulty of dealing with primitive types, I think, was really the thing that, that we were banging our heads against. And the organization had sort of experience in Scala, but it had been burned by the heat coming off of the uh, <coughs> heat sinks when compiling. Yeah. <laughs> so, so since then, we started a new uh, sort of strategic uh, program. We started it in Java 8. We had a very functional style of design. Uh, and after a while, we were thinking, well, I, mean, I was always banging on about how great Kotlin was. We had pretty much a Kotlin jar, a bit like a swear jar. Every time I said the K word, I'd <laughs> pound in. Um, but actually, you know, we were writing immutable models of our domain. And... Uh, eventually we were like, well, why don't we just replace these hundreds of lines of Java code with a single line of a data class in Kotlin, but just in that little bit of the code, you know, just to make it easier to manage our data model. Um, and then it was, well, you know, uh, is it much easier to deal with, you know, optionality if we can just actually use nullable types and have it type checked, and then we could do maybe have a little bit of, you know, and slowly the Kotlin spread throughout the Java 8, replacing Java 8, until now we've only got a tiny bit left. Uh, and IntelliJ's like automatic convert to Kotlin uh, really was amazing, mm. uh, uh, allowing us to just quickly convert that and then uh, turn it into idiomatic Kotlin and you see the code start shrinking. Skipping quickly on, um, <coughs> so um, uh, yeah, we sort of trying to gauge, we had a, a poll before, did anyone not keep up with Graham's talk? Okay, no game. Good, okay. <laughs> uh, next slide. Um, so, expressive. This is a talk about expressive Kotlin. What do we mean by expressive? Um, I think Tony Hall kind of nails it. Um, why do we want it to be expressive so that we know what it's doing, right? Um, and hey, um, it's kind of our contention that uh, we spend most of our time reading code, and the less that there is of it, the more likely it is to be right. There's also something, I think, about sort of specifications and um, you yeah. know, whether we actually understand what... what <coughs> what problem we were trying to yeah, solve? A, right? a lot of defects are really misunderstandings of the requirements. So I think an important aspect of writing uh, expressive code is to relate the logic in your code to the wider context, the business goals that the code is trying to achieve, so that when we're writing it, we're thinking about it and we're communicating it forward in time to ourselves in the future or whoever else is maintaining the code. Uh, so I think, you know, we're going to talk about some of the techniques that we sort of developed uh, uh, and learned over the year that we've been using Kotlin in production. So we, we kind of started thinking, yeah, we'll go straight for DSLs. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. But it turns out we only have 45 minutes. Um, <coughs> and sort of writing a DSL in 45 minutes is a bit hard. Um, but we realized, in fact, that um, one of the, the beauties we discovered of Kotlin is that it allows you to kind of evolve your way into a thing. You don't have to go the full you know, extension method well, <laughs> extension lambdas, I don't know. So, yeah, that DSL stuff, you know where we're going. Um, so there are simple things you can do straight away um, uh, that you just make your code more readable until, um, if you're lucky, um, well, just read. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> we'll see, yeah. I think. Uh, but particularly, yeah, small transformations that you can apply using IntelliJ, which has, you know, pretty good uh, and, and constantly improving refactoring support, uh, just constantly throughout, throughout the working on the code to like, lift up the level of expressiveness. Let's start off with uh, what we think is you know, one of the key uh, aspects. Yeah, Graham warmed you up on extension methods, but this is your slide, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, in fact, the way that Graham described them is the way that they're normally described uh, in the sort of Kotlin literature, which is you've got a type that you don't own, uh, but you can stick some new methods on it. Right? I can add a new string processing method onto string, and it's as if uh, it was defined on string in the first place. So the, the syntax is seamless, uh, and I think it's that seamlessness that makes extension methods so useful for making the code more expressive, as we're going to show. Uh, in the next few slides. And it's like we talked before because we seem to be talking about JSON nodes as well. So, hey, Jackson for the win. Um, so what we have here is, yes, an extension function on, um, on, a, on a JSON node, Jackson JSON node, that allows us to say, well, we expect a, a thing to be there. If it's not, that needs to be an error. Um, and that just allows us to call it, um, as you can see, uh, a little bit more friendlier um, node mandatory child name rather than the mandatory child of the node with the name this is great for what Martin Fowler calls collection pipelines, uh, where, and in fact, you know, the Kotlin standard library is full of useful extension methods on the, on the collection types and, and the sequence types for manipulating collections. And in fact, this is one of the things we really like coming to Kotlin. If you're using the stream API in Java, you can pass your functions into map and flat map or whatever they call them in Java 8. I, I, so long since I've done it, I've forgotten now. Um, but what you can't do is add a new stream operator to the API of streams. And so if you want to write a function that manipulates an entire stream, you have to write it in a way that looks different in your code than the ones that are provided by the stream API. And that, that bugs me. Uh, and, and the extension methods really uh, helped avoid that. So, um, so that was, um, we expected to be doing that. Uh, what we found later, beep, um, was that that we started ending up writing sort of more local, local extension functions. Um, so in this case, you can see the key thing about this one, I suppose, is it's private. It just happens to be lying around in this file. Um, and rather than um, trying to parse validate address address from JSON node, um, we can just add an extension function on JSON node um, to, <coughs> to help express things in this code, just in this file. Yeah, sometimes we even make them private to a class. Extension methods are instance methods of another object. Can get a bit confusing, so we won't talk about that. Uh, what's really nice about them is that they chain very nicely. As we've seen uh, in Graham's talk, uh, like that really helps you deal with null. Right? As a Java programmer, you learn never to use null. Right? Wrap your, some badly behaving Java library that returns null in some like, helper code, and never let null go anywhere near your own code. And one of the difficulties that, you know, that to overcome coming to Kotlin is you can use null again, uh, but the type checker is helping you out. So th like having chainable, uh, sort of nicely chained extension methods lets you safely write null safe reaching into sort of that nested data. Um, but also, well, it helps Duncan uh, yeah. read it. <laughs> we, le we learn to turn our brains inside out and understand that this thing is actually doing address from before it does this free delivery, before it does enable checkbox, right? But it's a lot easier to see if you read it from left to right. And so, yeah, we just end up writing all these little extension methods to uh, allow the thing to read. Yeah, and again, uh, with collection pipelines and sequence pipelines, it's like, a, it's like a Unix pipeline. You can see the sort of flow of data uh, through these things. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's great. And I think one of the things I really like about uh, extension methods is how they uh, really allow you to make the naming much more concise because the, the object that you're calling the extension method on is part of the context of the text that you're going to read. So here in the before example, uh, this is how we might write it in Java because, uh, because of the syntax of Java and just sort of conventions, you typically put a lot of sort of um, type information in these static methods that you statically import into your code. And then you have the same type information in the variable names. Uh, so you can see it gets very verbose and you're duplicating a lot of the same information uh, just in order to allow you to read the same code in different parts of the code base, whether you're looking at the definition or its use. Um, 
with an extension method, the context is all there, so the code can be much more concise. Uh, it reads much more naturally. If current user can edit this submission, uh, I don't need to say uh, that you know can edit takes a user and a submission because uh, it, it's it's obvious from the context. Also, can't go wrong. Quite often, we end up with things like user can edit submission, and you actually find that it takes an address, and you go, "What? How did that? What? Uh, refactoring?" Uh. Yeah, exactly. The less you need to <laughs> write, the less you forget to change as you change your code. Um, so, as well as these little extension functions on other people's types, we discover we we are writing them um, on our own types, um, and this is sort of a typical address. Um, it has uh, what you might consider is like platonic to addresses, we might ask address whether it's in the country, but well, you know, whether we give free delivery to an address, that's not really a thing about an address, but um, well, if it's convenience, you know, we end up putting an address class. And there's a bunch of other stuff the user interface needs, <coughs> and there's some stuff the database needs, and all these things get lumped into our address class. So what we've found is that, uh, and this actually answers a question that came from this side of the, of the room earlier, um, where do we sort of place our code? This is one of the things that was a change as we moved from Java. What we found is that we uh, write a lot more extension functions uh, rather than methods of our classes. So we might just put the, the absolute fundamental abs uh, abstractions, the methods about what does it mean to be an address onto the address class, and then we'll have extension functions about our own types in a module that is most appropriate for that type. So maybe uh, in a module about delivery decision making, we will have uh, an extension uh, function of address, uh, uh, you know, to return information about how we deliver to that address. In, a, in our user interface modules, we will have uh, extension functions that map an address into whatever we need to do to, to display it in, the, uh, in a user interface. In our persistence layer, we'll have an extension function that maps an address into, I don't know, like a SQL statements or a JSON that's stored in a database or, or what have you. Uh, it's important to, to say that you, you lose polymorphism this way. So um, if you've got a type hierarchy, um, you may break everything horribly. Uh, but on the plus side, um, um, we, it does mean that you can take your data classes, define them uh, in one place that doesn't depend on Hibernate and doesn't depend on Jackson and doesn't depend on your UI library and all those other things, because all those methods that you might end up lumping onto your address um, <coughs> mean uh, taken out into, into the user application layer. Um, so we can end up with these nice small little modules of really, uh, yeah, as I say, sort of platonic um, expressions of addresses and customers and so on, rather than those things that are needed for application. So certainly in the system that I'm working on, we have s settled, I guess, uh, sort of by default, uh, into putting things into class, like methods on classes when we want some polymorphism, and otherwise, a lot of the time just using extension methods uh, and importing them when we need them. Um, I think you might have other approaches. but uh, I, Yeah, I like using country, but apart from that, um, yeah, yeah, kind of where we are. Uh, another use. Um, so what are we saying here? I'm going to talk to this side of the room for a bit. <laughs> um, so... Uh, in the end, we end up writing, you know, trying to express a thing. We write the shortest, we write it uh, in line, and then we say, okay, well, I, that's got a bit complicated, so I'll pull out some sort of um, uh, <coughs> some sort of explaining variable. In this case, free delivery is available, um, and then I can ask that. Um, and, and in those cases, again, we'll tend to pull out extension functions, um, which will allow us, in case you see, uh, extension function on list of JSON node, um, which allows us to just call a thing in line. So. <laughs> this will allow us to not create new variables, um, and if you make these uh, inline uh, extension methods, then it's as if you'd call them in place. Uh, so all nice and efficient, and again, reads really nicely, so we're quite pleased with those. And we also add extension uh, functions onto our data classes, particularly to uh, sort of wrap up uh, calls to the copy uh, method which basically copy, gives you a new copy of the data class, but with slightly different properties. Uh, so we will wrap up those uh, into um, uh, sort of more helpful, more expressive names to sort of like re relate it to data, sorry, to the business logic that we're trying to do. 
Uh, it also helps reduce some of the duplication that, that uh, the copy uh, method sort of, uh, sort of forces you to write. So here we've got a submission, uh, which is like a, something that a scientist is going to send to us to publish. Uh, we want to add a new file to it. So we have to say submission.copy files equals submission.files plus new file. Uh, and with uh, data classes, you know, sometimes we found that you know, we'll transform it to get a new state, transform the new state again to get a further new state, and then do something with the final state. And if we accidentally use the wrong variable uh, in a call to copy, we'll have lost the appropriate uh, intermediate state, and we'll have lost the update. So uh, we'd much rather have extension methods on the uh, data class itself, which... Uh, uh, cop uh, call the copy method and uh, avoid the multiple references to the same this because it's implied uh, uh, by the body. You know, this is this is the, su the submission that we're calling the with no files on. Here we don't have to say uh, su you know submission dot files because it's implied uh, by the the object that we're calling this on. And we found that it's really helpful to have a sort of a common naming convention for these things. We've had some debates in the team, like what should we call these uh, helper methods? Uh, and so we sort of said, well, you know, a with files replaces the, the, the files in, in that data class, plus file will add a file, minus file uh, will remove a file, and that sort of relates to the sort of operator uh, method names. That, uh, you know, we don't get operator overloading here, but we are sort of following the same naming conventions uh, for any, uh, in any data class that we're extending in this way. Boy, are we bored with extension functions yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there is, uh, you know, if you, you you can go crazy with extension functions, but we uh, do find that, you know, you if you if all you're doing is adding extension functions, you end up with some uh, duplicated code. Uh, so here is uh, a little bit of code that you might write to implement a configuration uh, API that reads like configuration from properties files, but gives it back to your code in a strongly typed way. So I might want to uh, parse a URI out of a configuration file, I might want to uh, get a string out, I might want to get a, a long sort of a timeout. And each of these methods will have to like, look for the property, and if it's not uh, in the configuration file, fa fail in some way. And then it might have to try and parse it, and if the parsing fails, it has to fail in some way, otherwise it will return you the parse value. And so I'd have to write that for URIs, I'd have to write it for strings, I'd have to, well, strings, I'd have to parse it, but I'd have to write it for longs and so on. Uh, and so uh, to avoid that, what we're doing, we start doing is, is basically passing in functions or objects which represent the one bit that is different between these three different uh, functions. So here the get will like, try and find the string uh, value of the property, and then it will pass it over to a, a, a typed parser. Here's a definition of a parser for URI. Um, and then it, the parser's job is just to do the parse and return a null if it can't parse it. And then the get method can, like, if it's got a null one, it will fail. Otherwise, it will return the non-null value uh, back to the caller. So we, we removed uh, all the duplication, um, and, and even at the call site, we've not introduced any more duplication. We've just got the same information in the calls, but just represented in a slightly different way. But we've introduced a point at which it's easy to extend the behavior of this configuration class with new kinds of, uh, new kinds of, of property value without having to duplicate the logic that's already in the library. Do you want to ask me about the object? <coughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do that later. <coughs> okay, what's the next? Yes. All right, so, so one <laughs> thing... <laughs> I'm going to take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so the one, one thing that uh, we have, uh, I guess, struggled with a bit initially uh, when adopting uh, Kotlin coming from Java is a lack of checked exceptions. So, uh, you know, Things can fail, but we have no way in the type system to check that we are handling all kinds of exceptions in the, I appropriately, and that if we change some underlying library, uh, the exception that gets bubbled up is actually being caught, and it's not like running through, you know, we're not trying to catch the wrong one because we've changed some dependency. So uh, we've basically started taking, uh, we've, we've basically avoided using exceptions at all. We treat any exception as just a totally fatal error. Anything, any library that might use an exception, we sort of wrap up and return uh, the error in a different way. So here's how we might 
uh, do it. If you're coming from JavaScript, this is probably quite common uh, looking code. Um, so, so our first approach was to say, right, well, we'll, we'll have code uh, that a function that takes, that does something and will pass a success onto another function, so like a continuation, and we'll deal with the error and return that kind of error somehow to the caller. So here's how, this is how one of our HTTP servers is handling a request and turning it into a response. Right, the first thing we want to do is get a parameter, let's call it O. We're going to parse it as an order ID, right, in a similar way that we just saw on the previous slide. And if we don't have an O parameter on our request and we can't parse it as an order ID, we'll return an HTTP response which reports like bad request. Right? But if we do parse it, we pass a successfully passed order ID on to a function that will return an HTTP response. That function is an anonymous block which tries to authenticate, so it's going to look for a cookie, parse out an access token. If it can't do that, it will return unauthorized. Right? But if it can parse it, it will pass on the access token. And now we're in some kind of business logic where uh, because we've got all these nested lambdas and closures, we've got access to the parsed access token, the parsed order ID, uh, and we can use it to look up an order, and if we can look it up, we'll pass it on and re return it as JSON, otherwise we'll return a not found. Right? Uh, and as we add more and more processing, this <coughs> these blocks, nested blocks, get like wider and wider and wider, and, and it's, it makes the code really hard to read. It's so hard to read that, in fact, I guess back in the 90s sometime, people uh, coined this as, a, as an anti-pattern called the arrow anti-pattern because you get this sort of arrow shape in your code. Um, and so we sort of struggled with ways of uh, getting rid of this kind of code. Uh, and in fact, we sort of turned to the functional programming uh, literature and used abstractions from functional programming. So we introduced... Um, I don't know how I'm going to get through this without saying the M word, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, we, we introduced burritos. Um, so uh, we, we, we basically uh, introduced uh, a, a, an abstraction that we call HTTP result, which is sort of an intermediate half uh, step in the processing of uh, an HTTP request. It's either, it's, it's a sealed class hierarchy, so it's, there's two particular values it can hold. It's either uh, a successful, p like, uh, execution of the step and it's got an intermediate result that then needs to be turned, processed to turn into a response or it's a failure and the response is in the inside the HTTP result. So here we are saying, right, we're going to apply lookup order to uh, a result of that we've parsed out as a parameter and uh, the result of like uh, trying to authenticate and that will give us an order in one of these HTTP results which we will map to JSON and then finally we will turn the JSON into a response and this will give us back a response that's either any of the failures that could have happened here or a success, depending on how far you've got before you hit a failure. So, it, now, this is like, is it expressive? Uh, <laughs> certainly, it gets rid of a horrible arrow pattern. Once you're used to uh, uh, sort of some of the abstractions that are being used here, you kind of like know uh, how this works. And it certainly has simplified a lot of our code because we get a, a more of a linear flow through the processing of our HTTP request, for example, or our business logic. Uh, we can type check error handling, which we can't do if we're relying on exceptions. Um, but there's not a lot of language support like there is in, say, Scala. Um, if we're going to drill down and see exactly what this is doing. So this is that same function, but expanded out, where every single intermediate sort of step is shown as an HTTP result. So here we've got an HTTP result of order ID. So that's either a successfully passed order ID or a failure result. Here we're trying to authenticate. That's either giving us an access token or a not authorized failure response. Here, and then here we're ap applying the function lookup order to the successful results of those two results. Uh, if they are unsuccessful, it won't do anything, and it will just return one of those error messages. And finally, that will give us back an order or a failure message, and we'll try and map if it's successful uh, into a successful response. But we don't, you know, that, that's not making the code any more readable, so, you know, we do <coughs> normally collapse it. And under the hood, uh, we have a sealed class hierarchy, which um, the final speaker today is going to be talking about sealed classes, but it allows you to have uh, algebraic data types in Kotlin. So uh, an HTTP result is either a success with a value of type T that needs further processing, or a failure with a response to report the failure to the client. Um, and we can map a function over the success value. If there's a failure, that map won't do anything. It will just return the failure again wrapped up. But if there's a success, it will basically transform the successful value into another successful value. 
uh, and apply basically unwraps the values that you're passing to it to get the actual successful values and applies a function mm. to it, then wrapping it all back up into a result for further processing. But that's below the hood. I don't understand why I'm here with that light and they're the ones with rabbit and headlights. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, this is a, a, an interesting debate about how expressive can we make our code. Right, you look at this, there's a lot of mechanisms going on. Right? But actually, in our business logic and in our uh, HTTP processing logic, we don't see that. We sort of just write this kind of stuff. It's very concise, it's very short. Once you're used to the abstractions, it works very well. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, I, I work on the JVM. Yeah. I know that underneath my nice abstractions is a massive churning uh, machine of, of complete unknowability. Um, and I'm just <laughs> sort of like fine with that now. We, we, I mean, we, we have argued all afternoon, really, about, for example, whether apply is a good name for that, because apply is something that, you know, we know is another function uh, in Kotlin. Um, and, and whether there are any good words, really, um, yeah. Any good words for this stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but in the end, the no. Um, um, but in the end, I think um, we come to the conclusion that um, the nature of expressive code, uh, I mean, sometimes we're trying to do difficult things and, and we're just sort of winging how can we, can we give you an impression of whether or not this is what, <coughs> what you think it's doing. And in this case, I think, <coughs> generally speaking, you, I mean, if we go back to the original, which is a long way away, um, in this case, uh, you may be able to understand um, how it's doing it, but what it's doing is hidden from you. Uh, in this case, with uh, you know, a bit of a squint, um, how it's doing it is entirely hidden from you, goodness me, uh, but what it's doing may be a bit more obvious. Yeah. And certainly, as we get more and more complicated processing, this stays more linear, and you can see the steps in a more sort of linear fashion, so you understand the processing steps being applied although the way that they're getting bound together may be uh, a little bit opaque, um, but the arrows get bigger and bigger and harder and harder to understand what's going on. Uh, I mean, we can think of the HTTP result as a, as a little collection that either has a value in it or, or an explanation of why there isn't a value in it. Uh, and so some of the debate about what do we call the operations on this thing, should we use the same names as Kotlin's collections? We use map, like a list. Uh, do we use flat map or do we use something else? Um, Never filter, um, and so you know we have these debates. Uh, uh, but you know we've got extension functions, so we can write extension functions of HTTP result to explain what these sort of low-level things are doing in a higher-level, more domain-specific way that's appropriate to the the part of our code base in which we're using them. Um, and so you know extension functions give us a sort of the best of both worlds in a way. So we have ooh, 12 minutes left, I think. So we could. Uh, wrap up, or we could show you where, as we were learning Kotlin, we took things too far and made some horrible, horrible mistakes. Um, I can see some nodding about horrible mistakes. <laughs> yeah, misery yeah, loves company. Uh, let's see let's go on. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to that. Uh, okay. <coughs> yeah, you asked for it. Um, I found the top one in, uh, in some code that I wrote, um, and I'm still not entirely sure. I think it's. Um, it's I think currying. it's currying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's a function that returns another function, which is defined as another thing. Um, and even in fact, the example doesn't really help a lot. Um, um, yeah, we call it. Um, well, in fact, do we have a uh, yes? Uh, single expression addicts. That yes. was a, a, <coughs> We are. I mean, <coughs> we are pretty ad addicted to single expression functions, and I think it's the same in Scala, probably. Um, and you know, if if the point of this game isn't to make every function into a single expression, I don't want to play. Um, <coughs> now, obviously, that can go too far, um, but it has um, um, it has motivated um, some of these some of these techniques. Like, what? How much can I? Not, maybe not cram into a single expression, but can I make it so that single expression is a readable thing? Can I break it out into other functions? Can I make it all work at, at, at an appropriate level of abstraction? Um, I think uh, let and apply, they're great little uh, tools in your toolbox, but once you start scattering them around a function to make it a single expression, it can be, become really quite unreadable. Yeah, I mean, I think you can only have one of let or apply, right? Yeah. There's got to be a rule. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I trawl through our code base, and yeah, we've got some pretty hairy ones, and I know that people who've sort of joined a project said, well, what's all this let and apply all over the code? Um, and so actually pulling out ex a, a single ex uh, extension methods again, like to actually explain what's going on, 
simplifies reading the code, but also gets rid of a lot of the need for let and apply anyway, because you know, you're calling it and you've got this context, which would otherwise be in your let, but actually it's just in a body of a function, and a lot of the syntactic noise goes away. Shall we look at what else we did wrong? In fixation. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so I wrote a configuration library called config with a K. Uh, apologies for overusing that K naming convention. I'm over it now. Um, and I'm also over, <coughs> over using uh, infix functions. So I thought, oh, yeah, I, I want to have like uh, sort of layered configuration files and, and sources of configuration data so that, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to sort of like look at like it's a stuff component to my app, but then I'm going to like maybe look at some environment variables and they'll override the defaults and then actually the system properties that I pass on the command I will override the environment variables. That's great. Uh, and, and that's kind of overriding. I sort of I can write an infix function to make it look like some magical DSL. Then you can't drop that overriding onto the next line. Uh, yeah, it's so all actually it confuses horrible. the parser. Um, once you've released a library onto Maven Central with an infix, func uh, infix function in it, you can never uninfix it again because you'll break lots of code. You can go, if, you, if it originally it's like a normal method call, you can make it infix and the normal method syntax will still work, but you can't go vice versa. So, so that's stuck now. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. So we use it pretty much like we have, we, we have uh, you know, something like, uh, something like the two method for building pairs of things. We have an of for building JSON objects, like l to have sort of name value pairs, but in JSON, in Jackson. Um, and we have a few other tiny little places we use. About hardly yeah. at all, actually. Every now and again, a little funk between one thing and another. Yeah, but yeah. yeah maybe and and or to sort of like represent uh, sort of like uh, logical operators, but then they're not, they don't have the same sort of behavior as a normal logical operator. So anyway, we sort of don't do that very much. Uh, operator punning. This one I'm really ashamed of. Um, so I wrote a little, uh, some code to basically represent uh, URL paths for routing. Is that a 10 minute or a 5 minute? 10. Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so, you know, I'd like to be able to define paths out of strings and uh, sort of parses for the path elements to, so that in my HTTP routing, it automatically parses an incoming request against a path description, giving me back properly typed objects. And also does reverse routing. It's brilliant, really handy. Um, and I was like, well, and I also want to append paths together and stuff. And, you know, the division operator looks a bit like a path separator in a URL. Uh, so th doesn't this look clever? This looks really awesome. I'm s yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it didn't do that again. Um, You're so ashamed, though, that you didn't exactly get over punning, did you? <laughs> no. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, the lesson learned is, like, okay, uh, a properly named method may be longer, um, but it's the lesser of two weevils. Oh, oh. expected <laughs> more of a reaction. Yeah, okay, I think, <laughs> I, I think we should skip across. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, that, I think this is a, probably our last slide. This is... Uh, this is actually a thing, isn't it? This isn't, this isn't a, a cautionary tale. This is a no, thing we found quite thing. handy. Yeah, we've got some techniques we use that... Um, we don't use a lot of reflection, actually, and we don't use a lot of inheritance and things like that, so our code is not very Java-esque. But, but the, there are ways of getting static in, you know, information from the compiler that is dynamic, so reflection uh, in, a, in a controlled way in Kotlin, uh, and particularly rarefied types. So here is an implementation of a parser that we might use for a configuration or something we saw earlier. Uh, and I want to be able to say, I want to name the thing that's being parsed so that in error messages I can say, I could not parse this as a URI, right? Um, but that's quite verbose, right? Actually, what I want to be able to do is grab the name of this, but I want to do it without reflection. I don't want to have to pass the class object in or anything like that. Um, what I would like to be able to do is say that URI is a parser where I just do this and it will give me the name uh, automatically. So here is a factory function which can do that. It, it's inline. Uh, and I'm saying that the it's, it's generic and the type parameter is rarefied, which means that the compiler will insert into the code uh, the appropriate, like, whatever needs to be done to, put to, to, tr to find out what that actually is at runtime. Uh, and therefore, I can refer to it down here and get its name out, uh, uh, and, and therefore I don't need to actually refer to T class and pass it around whenever I want to define a parser, and I don't have to define the name, duplicating the name from the class. It gets inferred by the compiler, passed in, and I can, you know, I've got the reflective access, but also, uh, but but it's also type safe. So that's awesome. And by the same token, you can get the name of a function that's passed into things as well, which is occasionally yes. useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I wrote a testing library called Hamcrest with a K. Sorry about that. Um, and. <laughs> uh, 
And um, yeah, so I can pass in a function reference, uh, and like it, you get back a, an object that's passed in. That is a function, so you can call it just like a function, but you can also ask for its name, and then you can use that to create good error messages. It's great. So we should go back to the, 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 oh, uh, there, or should we ask the, one? No, 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 no. What? Uh, oh, conclusion. We have conclusions. Conclusion, yeah. We have conclusions. So, uh, <laughs> let's check what I'm going to do. Ah, yeah. Um, all right, so our conclusion is actually that, um, uh, you know, we've been working on, you know, doing very small design improvements continually, uh, like by introducing extension methods and other uh, forms of sort of syntactic sugar, uh, to, but often just to reduce duplication. Um, and as a result, the code looks, you know, as if we've developed like small domain-specific languages in our code. So we might have uh, a little bit of domain-specific language about handling uh, HTTP and building JSON and, uh, you know, other small pieces in our code. Uh, but we haven't sat down and designed a DSL. Now, if I was writing a, a library that I was going to publish and it was a DSL like API, I'd have to think more carefully about the design. But for a continually evolving application, continually uh, doing small little improvements, uh, like basically produces over time uh, a really nice DSL-like sort of feel to the code and, and, and it lifts you up to higher and higher levels of abstraction and relates your code to the business domain. Uh, and then it's, yeah, very good. We should ask questions. Do you have a question? <coughs> uh, yeah, this was sprung on us at, at the last minute. So um, there was one question I wanted to ask but we're going to ask you now. Where is it? Da, 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 da. This is for the whatever the prize was. Da, 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 da. Oh, where was it? I've lost it now. It was your example, wasn't it? Uh, one more. One more. That one. Ah, yeah. So, um, okay, we're going to need a, like a plausible answer as opposed to just the first handling of that. <laughs> um, what we don't know is, so we've got these object literals. Object literals? I mean, what are they? Singletons. So this object URI here, um, which implements some parser of URI, uh, and, and Nat wrote this, and I asked him, well, what's the difference between that and a value uh, that is, um, you know, returns a defined to be a parser of URI? So I could have written uh, val URI equals object colon parser URI, but instead I wrote object URI colon parser URI. I guess the question you're asking yeah. is... Yeah, why did you do that? What is the difference? Oh, yeah. Are there any advantages to this or the other? I don't know. Anybody? Oh. Um, is it because it's a singleton with yeah. only one element? It is a singleton with only one element. But so would a val be. So would a val be. Mm. And it would be compiled the same way, you see. It's Laziness. Oh, ah. that, that is a yes. That is, okay, yes. I think that's the right answer. Yeah, we'll give that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had, we had, a, we had a, a, a mad scramble through the documentation on the tube over. <laughs> yeah, uh, an object literal is lazily evaluated the first time you refer to it. A val is eagerly evaluated or instantiated the first time the class is loaded into the JVM. Is that correct? That is correct. I have <laughs> official confirmation. <laughs> but there are other differences which we're happy to discuss over beer. There will be beer. <laughs> uh, so uh, probably two minutes. Time for a couple of questions, maybe? Okay, yes. Uh, before questions, I must point out uh, to say thank you to oh Springer yes. Nature for uh, allowing us to talk about uh, some of the work we've done there and to mention that they are hiring. Uh, there's a website about uh, uh, jobs. Um, and more and more people across the department are using Kotlin in their projects. Uh, we're seeing it spread, uh, and, it's, uh, and people are really liking it. Are there any questions? One, one sec. Sorry, just mic. Um, it's okay. As you're killing through your code base, you're adding more and more of those seal classes, and you don't have a way of abstracting over the burritos. <laughs> for, uh, for all the different ones. So how, um, yeah, how have you found a solution for that problem? So we have uh, extension functions that translate from one to another, but we don't combine them in the same domain. Uh, so we don't, we're not 
We're not going full on with the monad transform. Oh, I said that word. Uh, I failed, I failed. Uh, we're not going you know, full on with the burrito transformers and all of that because the, the type system in Kotlin uh, doesn't support higher kinded types doesn't have the capability um, but what we do have is you know we have a result type which is for our business logic where we report business level failures we have an extension function that can translate that into HTTP failures which is defined inside the sort of HTTP layer of a particular application so it knows if I see this business failure from from here for these clients I'm going to return it as this kind of status code and other parts of the system may be translating them into HTTP results in a different way. We have helper methods to go from optionals into results and HTTP results again, which is really jumping from <coughs> one burrito to another. Um, uh, yeah, so, so you know, extension methods to the win, you know, for the win uh, again. Um, I mean, it would be nice to, you know, the apply function uh, that we sort of showed earlier it is basically, you know, would be what a for comprehension does in Scala or a do uh, statement does in Haskell, but we don't have language support for that. It'd be great if we could. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, it still helps a lot. Hi. Uh, can I ask, how often do you use open modifier for classes? Because uh, I don't know the context you're using Kotlin. Because if you're, for example, using the proxy-based framework like Spring, then you're having the transaction. You need to put, uh, you know, open for the concrete classes, yeah. unless you're using the interface. But yeah. I just want to check uh, how often do you need to use that open modifier? I think we have no open classes in our code base at all. Um, I don't know about your one. I mean, we have yeah. slightly different <laughs> approaches to development in our code base. We have uh, no, s no subtyping, really, apart from sealed class hierarchies. We have uh, data classes, mostly, a very little uh, sort of subtype polymorphism, um, no reflection at all. Uh, we really want to lean on the type system. We've got a you know, much better type system than we're used to in Java, and we're leaning on it to the absolute max to catch errors uh, you know, as much as possible. And we try and model in the type at the type level in order to you know, help us think about things and catch errors at compile time. Yeah. Um, uh, and certainly, like, if you looked at the HTTP processing, that's done by, you know, function composition rather than reflection and bytecode manipulation. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, I, I think we do have, um, <coughs> my project does have a bunch more sort of subtyping, um, <coughs> but no spring, so um, I guess we just let off the hook, really. <laughs> uh, if, if I may just, just add to that, that we're adding a new functionality, I don't know if you've heard about, but it's a plugin, both for the compiler, it's a compiler plugin that will allow you to uh, just describe certain annotation as open, so when you annotate those classes, in the case of Spring, the compiler will assume that they're open, so you don't have to add the open modifier. For the 1.1? For the 1.1. Or no, actually, it will probably be available for the 1.0 as well, in the minor update. Okay. okay? I think we're, if there's no other questions, we're more or less done in timing. Okay, so um, please go outside. There is food, drinks at the bar. Um, I do recommend to order the Punk IPA versus the Dead Pony. It's got a higher percentage of alcohol. Um, and please do come back here at 8 p.m. for Dominic's talk. Thank you.